All right, good morning, everybody. My name is Mark Lee. I'm one of the pastors here at Vantage Point Church. You know, uh, you kind of go off script a little bit. Like, I'm just so overwhelmed. Like, I, I, I love being the pastor of this church. I love being with you guys. I mean, this is just like a dream come true for me. So thank you for being here this morning. Um, today, what we're going to do is we are in week three or week four, or I don't, I, in fact, know which week we're in, honestly, but we're, in, we're right in the middle of a series called Scary Stories, where we're talking about some of the most harrowing, some of the craziest stories of the entire Bible. In fact, this morning, we're, we're going to jump right into the Word of God. So if you have your Bibles this morning, why don't you turn to Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. If you aren't extremely, extremely familiar with your Bible, it might be a little bit uh, difficult to find, so there's no harm in using your table of contents, honestly. The book of Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, we're going to start right from the beginning. Why don't we do this? Why don't we all stand as we honor the reading of God's word this morning? Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, it says this, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. She went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to do what? Say that with me. To flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up, and all the sailors were afraid. Oh no! And each cried out to their own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, Arg, how can you sleep during a time like this? Get up and call on your God and maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on who? Say it with me. Dun, dun, dun. So they asked him, tell us, who is responsible for making all of this trouble for us? And men, what kind of work do you do? Are you a pimp? Are you a... Are you a loan shark? Are you a country music singer? What are you exactly? Where do you come from? What is your country? What people are you? And he answered, well, I am a Hebrew. And I worship the Lord, the God of heaven. For some reason, I picture Jonah sounding like Droopy the dog. I don't know. <laughs> the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. <gasps> This terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them. So now give Jonah at least this much credit that he's running away from the Lord, but he admits it, right? Hey, Jonah, what are you doing? Just running away from the Lord. <laughs> I'm just disobeying God. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do? To you to make the sea calm down for us. And Jonah in his own selflessness will say this. Why don't you pick me up and throw me into the sea? He replied and it will, be, it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Okay, now again, Jonah, uh, he doesn't just want to be a part of the problem. He wants to be a part of the solution. It just so happens to be that his solution is suicide, which probably isn't a very good idea. Why don't you jump to verse 15 with me? Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. And at this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. You guys can go ahead and have a seat this morning. Now, can I tell you this? Jonah always seems to get a bad rap as a prophet, doesn't he? We're always bagging on Jonah, always hating on Jonah for some reason. But can I tell you this? Where I want to start out in our study of Jonah this morning is this. That did you know that the first time that we ever hear about Jonah is not in the book of Jonah. It's actually in the book of 2 Kings. And in the book of 2 Kings chapter 14, it tells us something about this man of God. 
that as he prophesies to the nation of Israel, that God greatly prospers that nation and that God even increases their borders. That here you have a man, the myth, the prophet. Here you have somebody who is popular, who is very popular and very sought after. And what I want to do this morning is I want to give Jonah just a little bit of love before we start out. And I want to give Jonah just a little bit of credit. Do you know why? Because it's the fish that's always stealing the story. The fish is the one who's always getting the credit. You know, and everybody's always trying to scientifically decipher whether or not the the esophagus of a fish can sustain life for three days or for three nights or whether it's an analogy. Now, I'm going to tell you my own personal opinion, and that is, that is this, that the God who spun this entire universe into existence from absolutely nothing, that it is not too difficult for him to protect a man inside of a fish for three days and for three nights. Does anybody out there believe the same thing with me? Amen. After all, you lived inside of a woman for nine months. So it just so happens that I believe in something called a miracle. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, you are a miracle. Now here's here's the thing. Some of you didn't just believe that because, uh, you know, there's friction in the family. There's trouble in paradise. But you know what? Just like a lot of us, there's a dark side to Jonah's character. There is a very, very, very dark side to Jonah's character. And that is the fact that in chapter 1, verse 2, the Bible tells us that the word of the Lord had come to Jonah, that God had a very specific purpose for him, that God had a very specific ministry for him. And what we're going to find out in just a little bit is this, that Jonah is going to try and run from God's call just as far and as, just as fast as he possibly can. You can go ahead and put up that map for a second if we have it. I want you to think about this for a second. There is the port of Joppa and God calls, uh-oh, you better watch out, I got a laser pointer. Um, God calls, I know I'm legit now aren't I? This is awesome. I've made it. Okay, now I want you to look at this for a second. Joppa is right here. That's on the south portion of the nation of Israel. And God only, as if 550 miles is not a long way to go by foot, honestly, 550 miles to the east to go to Nineveh. Okay, now this is what I want you to think about. Not only does the word of the Lord come to Jonah, and Jonah just decides to himself, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, the kids have soccer practice, God, and you know what? We have responsibilities, and I, I, I can't take that much time off of work. You know, Jonah doesn't do that. You know what he does? He goes five times that amount of distance in the complete and total opposite direction. God wants him to go east. He goes west Five times that distance, it would have taken him a year's worth of sailing to get from Joppa to Tarshish. What we know is this, that Jonah doesn't just want to disobey God. Jonah wants to run away and he wants to get as far and he wants to get as fast away from God as he possibly can. Here's the principle and here's the point that we want to talk about today. That today in your life, that today, Sunday, September 21st in 2014, the word of the Lord is going to come to you. God is going to have you do something in your life as you move towards a relationship or a responsibility or a worshipful lifestyle in your life. And you are either going to move towards God or you are going to move away from God. You are either going to move towards God's purpose for your life or you are going to move away from God's purpose in your life. Today, I'm not talking about in the future. I'm not talking about some vague idea. Today, you are either going to move towards God's command for your life or you're going to move away from God's command in your life. I want you to think about this for a second. Last week, we studied about a prophet who was the anti-Jonah. And his name was, does anybody remember last week? His name was 
Elijah, you guys are really encouraging me when it comes to this sermon stuff, okay? Last week, we studied about a prophet named Elijah or Eliyahu, and Eliyahu understands something about the rhythm of response when it comes to God. Think about this. Look at 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 1 with me. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 1, it says this, that after a long time in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go and present yourself to the evil king Ahab, the most powerful man in the area. And verse 2 says this, so Elijah, say that word with me, went. God has a command for him, the word of the Lord comes to him, and then he responds to it in obedience, and he does that immediately. Now look at Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, it says this, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh, but Jonah, say this with me, ran away from the Lord. I just thought that contrast was so extremely, extremely, extremely interesting. Do you know why? Because I think it's interesting that the same God can put the same call on two different people and have two completely and totally different responses. That one is going to call down fire from heaven and the other one's going to get swallowed up by a fish. And so, here's the question that I have for you. Which one are you going to be today? Because you will either be one or the other. That whether you like it or not, that whether you know it or not, that God speaks to you every single day. And your response to God's voice and your response to the prompting of the Holy Spirit is going to be so, so, so extremely critical. That when God speaks to you, that when the word of the Lord comes to you, are you going to see that as an interruption or are you going to see that as an invitation? Maybe you're a stay-at-home mom this morning, stay-at-home mom. You stayed at home because you want to be able to invest in your life in a significant, significant way. I mean, I know a lot of working moms who would kill to be in your circumstance, but maybe you're cooking dinner, maybe you're watching TV, maybe you're reading a blog post or whatever the case may be, and your child comes up to you that needs a little bit more tender love and care. Here's the question I have for you. Are you going to see that as an interruption or are you going to see that as an invitation? You know, tomorrow, some of you, when you go to work, maybe there is an honest conversation that needs to be had with somebody at work that is interfering with your leadership or the effectiveness of whatever it is that you're doing. And honestly, you have neglected that conversation for some time, thinking to yourself that if you just kind of put it off to the side, well, then it'll just kind of go away by itself. Here's a question I have for you. Are you going to move towards God's will for your life? Are you going to move away from God's will for your life? life. Can I tell you this? Maybe you're the one who wanted the divorce in the first place. And now you're sitting there complaining about the amount of child support that you have to pay. And it's easy to make a child, but it's difficult to father a child, isn't it? Are you going to move towards your God-given responsibility in life? Or are you going to move away from your God-given responsibility in life? Can I tell you this? I think somewhere around 15 years ago, I was working as a civil engineer in the great city of Noblesville, Indiana. And the word of the Lord had come to me, and God had said, here's what I want you to do, Mark. I want you to go ahead and forget your degrees in engineering. I want you to go ahead and forget, you know, the the project management that you had just finally started to work towards. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to drop all of that and I want you to become a pastor. What? Am I going to see that as an interruption? Or am I going to see that as an invitation? You know what Jonah did? Jonah saw that as an interruption, didn't he? Now before you go ahead and start hating on Jonah, here's what I want you to think about. You would have too. Do you know why? Because I want you to think about this for a second. You 
are a successful prophet. You walk into a restaurant, man, you don't even need a reservation. All of a sudden, you know, the, the mater d just kind of shows you to your table. You know, the nation is prospering because of you. Everybody loves you. You're young. You're popular. You're good looking. Access Jerusalem wants interviews with you all over the place. And now, now it's at the highlight of your career. You are Elvis Presley at this point. Now, all of a sudden, you get a letter from the United States of God saying that you have been drafted to go to Iraq. Show us that map again one more time. Can you do that? I mean, literally, Nineveh is modern day what? Modern day Iraq, okay? Here you are, successful councilman. Here you are, successful businessman. Here you are, successful teacher. You know what? Your life is all set and now God wants you to go to Iraq. You know what? You probably wouldn't think of that as a very good idea. You'd probably think to yourself, yeah, God, I don't really think that your voice, as much as that's probably like the pizza that I ate last night, so I'm going to hold off on that one, and I'm going to pray about that a little bit more because that doesn't really sound like your will to me because I'm not even fighting in a war. You want me to go to Iraq, and you want me to spread the gospel in Iraq? No, no, like I'm not doing that. That, that, doesn't sound, that doesn't sound like a real fun thing to me. Can I tell you this? That is exactly what God was calling Jonah to do. God was calling Jonah to go to, I'm really getting my money's worth out of this laser pointer, aren't I? God is calling Jonah to go to modern day Iraq. Not, I, I want you to think about this for a second. Not only to the city of Nineveh, but God calls it what? Can anybody tell me? God calls it the great city of Nineveh. I want you, Jonah, to go to the great city of Nineveh. Can I tell you this? Nineveh was not a great city. Nineveh, the Ninevites were horrible people. The Ninevites were terrorists. The Ninevites were the enemies of God's purpose and God's plan. The Ninevites were known to rip the sexual organs out of men and women alike. The Ninevites were known to dismember people, which probably is not too different from even the modern day that we live in right now. They were known to dismember people and to shake their body parts or to shake their hands, to shake their body part, dismembered body parts in front of their faces before they went ahead and killed them. Some historians even believe that the Ninevites made their enemies listen to Justin Bieber until their ears bled. Now turn to your neighbor and say, that's evil. <laughs> now, you and I almost think that God asked Jonah to do something easy, and then all of a sudden, Jonah just kind of copped an attitude, and he had a bad hair day, and he just wanted to not do what God had to say all of a sudden. God had called Jonah to do something extremely, extremely, extremely difficult. And maybe you and me, maybe you have grown up in the Christian church and you have all sorts of like easy answers to the problems of life. And maybe for you, you might say something like, well, you know what? We all got to go to our own Nineveh. It's almost like you're saying, you know what? Well, we all got to go, or go to our own DMV or something like that. Here, here's what you have to understand. God wasn't calling Jonah to do something easy. This calling not only went against Jonah's sense of convenience. This calling went against Jonah's very sense of justice. It, it went against he, his own racist, but also his own very sense of right and wrong. And here's, here's, here's what I want you to think about today. That every time you receive an instruction from the Lord... That every time you receive instruction from God, uh, even if you don't understand it, especially if you don't understand it, you know what God is actually doing? God's instruction is actually an invitation. That God's instruction, especially if it appears to be an interruption, is actually an invitation, if you will call it that. 
Can, can I tell you this? Sometimes all you and I need is a change of perspective. Sometimes you and I, it is what we call it. Can I tell you this? Because maybe you call your marriage a prison. I mean, maybe not to your wife. Maybe, maybe not out loud. But if you call it the old, if you think of it as the old ball and chain, it's going to feel like the old ball and chain. But if you call it the way that God sees it, then God will make it and change it what he knows that it has the potential to be. Can I, can I tell you this? If you call the demands of your life stressful, then guess what's going to happen? They're going to feel stressful. But if you say to God, well, you know what? Thank you, God, for the busyness of life. Because if I'm busy, well, that means that you still have a purpose for me. If I'm alive, that means that I'm not dead. And if I'm alive, that that means that I'm not in a hospital bed someplace. So you know what, God? Thank you for the activity of life. Thank you for the busyness of, of life. Some of you are saying, well, I just got to kind of go to work. You know what? Work is just another four-letter word. Would you stop calling it that? Would you call it something other than a dead-end job? Call it a proving ground. Call it a temporary assignment. Call it whatever you want. Call it something else. It's a calling if you call it that. Can I tell you this? If you call your children a burden, then they're going to feel like a burden, and then they will become a burden. But if you call your children a blessing, then they will feel like a blessing to you, and they will become a blessing to you. God goes to Jonah and says, I know about the misconceptions that you have about this city called Nineveh, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to the great city of Nineveh. Isn't it good news to you and good news to me that God does not see us as we are, but that God sees us as we should be? That you know what? I want you to go to the great city of Nineveh because I want to visit that city with the gift of repentance and life and love. And so Jonah, this is what we know. Jonah gets swallowed up by a fish. He spends three days and three nights in the belly of a whale. Does anybody think that that number has significance today? He ends up calling on the Lord. The Lord hears him and the fish goes ahead and spits him up onto dry, dry ground. You know, repentance, redemption, regurgitation. I mean, this story pretty much has it all. And now, here's what I want you to think about. The most beautiful verse. Now, here is the most beautiful verse in the entire book of Jonah. And that is this. Jonah chapter 3 verse 1, it says this. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Say that with me. What? A second time. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Here's what I want you to think about. That when God places a calling on your life, or when God brings a word to your life, there are really only two options that you have at that point. You can either embrace it, or you can escape it. And here's what you find out, that even when you try and escape it, then even when the enemy tries to send you a ship that's going to take you in the opposite direction from God's will, you know what God's going to do? God's going to provide an even bigger ship to bring you back to his plan and his purposes. And here's what you have to understand about the book of Jonah. That the book of Jonah is not a book about human disobedience. The book of Jonah is about this. That in light of your greatest disobedience, then in light of your stupidest mistakes, then in light of the dumbest things that you have, you have ever done in your entire life, that God works through your human disobedience in order to bring himself glory. Can I tell you this? If I were to encapsulate this entire book into one sentence, it might be something like this. That God can do anything for anybody, anytime, anywhere. That God can do anything for anybody, 
anytime, anywhere. That even after you've been running away from God, that even after your divorce, that even after your abortion, that even after you've yelled at that person a million times, that even after you've lost your job because it was all your fault to begin with, that even after you've screwed up your life, that you know what? That you and I serve the God of the second chance and the third chance and the fourth chance. And I know that all you perfect people don't have anything to say amen about today. But you know what? If you've ever made a mistake with your life, if you've ever gone left when you should have gone right, if you've ever said no when you should have said yes. Can I tell you this? It should be good news for you today that you know what? That God's got call waiting. And God will call you over and over and over and over and over again. That God will chew you up and that God will spit you out and God will do anything that he can to realign you according to where he wants you to go. Can I tell you this? In chapter 1, Jonah has nothing but excuses. In chapter 2, Jonah has regrets. Would you please write this down? That today's excuses are nothing more than tomorrow's regrets in disguise. Today's excuses are nothing more than tomorrow's regrets in disguise. That today's excuses will not tell you that if you cheat your entire way through high school that you're going to be stupid by the time you get a job. Today's excuses aren't going to tell you that if you feast on a steady diet of porn, that guess what? It's going to destroy your appetite for real women. That today's excuses aren't going to tell you that if you keep spending like you're spending, that you're going to work until the day that you die. Today's excuses are nothing more than tomorrow's regrets in disguise. And you know what? For me, I'm almost grateful for the fish. Do you know why? Because you know what the fish teaches us? The fish teaches us something about the character and nature of God. That it is only God and through his power and through his glory that God can take your misery and that God can turn that into a ministry. Here you have a prophet that's gone a wall from a situation. God, where did my man go? He used to be on the front lines and now he's nowhere to be found. God has every right to court-martial him. God has every right to dishonorably discharge him, but God doesn't do that. God has a plan for Jonah, and God has a purpose for Jonah, just like God has a plan for you, and God has a purpose for you as well. Man, I wish we could talk about this book the entire day, but we can't. So for the sake of time, here's what I want... Here's what I want you to think about. Jonah, even in his reluctance, decides that he's going to go to the city of Nineveh. And the book of Jonah doesn't even tell us very much about uh, Jonah's sermon. It just says that Jonah goes up in front of the city of Nineveh and says that after 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. And then the Bible tells us that the Ninevites believed in God. And for me, it's almost like, is that all I have to do? Am I, am I wasting my time with all of this sermon prep stuff? I want you to think about this for a second. Maybe, maybe you spend all that time getting ready in the morning and you get your kids dressed and you come to church and you, you, know, you find a seat in the auditorium and you worship and then all of a sudden I take the mic and I go, after 40 days, Eastvale will be destroyed. Let's pray you would be like, this was the biggest waste of time in the entire world. And yet, here's what I want to tell you, that part of the reason for that, there's a reason for that. And part of the reason for that is because it was never about Jonah to begin with. It was never about Jonah's sermon. It was never about an evil people. It was never about a fish that would swallow him up. It was that this is all about the character and the nature of the God that Jonah will represent. You don't believe me? Why don't you look at this? Look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. 
Matthew chapter 12, verse 38, it says this. Teacher, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. Have you ever asked God for a miracle? God, if you would just show me a miracle, then I would have something to see. And if I only had something to see, then maybe then I would believe. And Jesus says this, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except for the sign of the prophet who... Jonah, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than Jonah is here. Can I tell you this? For all of you who are trying to escape your calling in this life, for all of you who are moving away from God's commands, for all of you who find yourself on a ship to Tarshish, what the Bible is saying is this, that there is one who is greater than Jonah that is here today. That Jonah spent his entire life moving away from the will of God, and Jesus, who is greater than Jonah, spent his entire life moving towards the will of God. That you know what? That Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of a whale because of his own disobedience. And Jesus was laid in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights because of our disobedience. That the fish spit Jonah out in order to give him a second chance. And the grave spit Jesus out in order to give you and in order to give me a second chance. And God wants to know if there's anyone here who is grateful that there is one who is greater than Jonah that is here today. God says this, that no matter how far you run from me, not a, no matter how many steps you might take from me, guess what? It really only takes you one step to come back. For some of you, can I tell you this? You might be able to fool everybody. The person next to you is looking at you thinking that you got your stuff all together. But there was a time and there was a day where you said no to God. It could have been weeks ago. It could have been months ago. It could have been years ago. You said no to God and you know what? You thought you could get away with it. And God says this. That no matter how far you run from me, that guess what? That you cannot run forever. That surely goodness and love will follow me, stalk me. That's what that word means. Did you know that? That surely goodness and love will stalk me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Some of you have been running away from maybe not just a responsibility or a mission. Some of you have been running away from God himself. That you know what? That no matter how many times you went to church as a kid, no matter how many times you, your parents prayed for you and brought you up in the ways of the Lord, you wanted to do nothing with it. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says this, that today is the day of salvation. Maybe today is going to be the day that you say, you know what? I'm just going to stop running, God. God. Because I'm tired. And I've realized this, that no matter how many steps I take in the opposite direction, that you will never, ever leave me alone. So today, I just want to do something, Lord, called surrender. And I want to surrender my entire life to you today. Why don't we do this? Why don't we all stand? Why don't we all bow our heads and pray? Why don't we bow our heads? Father God, as we come before you today, Lord God, we want to thank you, Father, that the word of the Lord has come to us. And we thank you, Father, that you are a God of second chances, that you are a God of third chances, and that you are a God of fourth chances, Lord. And Father, this is what we pray, that for some of us, Lord God, we're just tired, God. We're tired because we're spinning our own wheels. We're tired because we're going in the wrong direction, Lord God. And as much as we try and run and as much as we try and get away from you, we never seem to. 
Lord. So I pray for some of us who just want to give up today, Lord God, that when it comes to fighting you or when it comes to running against you, God, that we would just go ahead and give up, Lord. Father, because we know that, Lord God, that your, your mercy and grace will stalk us, that it will follow us, that it will never let us go. Jesus, I pray that, Lord Jesus, that we would surrender ourselves completely into your hands because we know that, Father, that, it, that, that that is the only place that we should be. That is the place that you were born to us for. So, Father, we want to meet our purpose. We want to meet, meet our maker. We want to come into or re-come into our relationship with you, God. We love you so much, Lord. We pray all these things in your precious son's name. And all God's people say,